fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. Welcome back into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren. And, you know, we've got Michael Hawley here. So, you know, it's a historical crime day today when we're doing Michael. Absolutely. And I love that. Yeah. <laughs> and we know that's because you were born back in the, like, 1800s or something. I'm, so. I'm only a couple months older than you, Al. A couple that's of months it. and a hundred yeah. years. Come yes. on. Be- but then again, I heard you uh, remember the Jazz Age. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I remember hanging out in the in the opium dens and okay. listening to jazz and yeah, I did all that stuff. Yeah, and I'm still here to talk about it. So we've got an interesting uh, book we're going to talk about and a great author. He's been here before. Um, so the book is called Shadow Men, and it is the tangled story of murder, media, and privilege that scandalized the jazz age of America. James Polchin, thank you for being here. Great to be here. Thank you, Ellen. Nice speaking with you. Good to speak to you. That's a that's a short title. <laughs> <laughs> it is. We had to get it all in. <laughs> so, so what 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 draws you to your case first of all when you when you set out to write a book because this is a five year process or it could be longer or so it depends on on everything but. When you're doing this, what for you is the thing that attracts you the most? Well, for this case, particularly, um, I was really attracted to the time period. The 20s, of course, is layered with many stories of crime and criminals. And it's, you know, this, for me also, it's this moment, I think, for the modern America that we understand today kind of took shape, I think, in this period from World War I on, right? And so that, that really intrigued me about this. Um, and the more I got into this case, the more I, it was just echoing so many contemporary issues around criminal justice, around privilege, wealth, class, all of these issues started coming out and impressive role in this, in this case. So all those issues started to feel very contemporary to me. And so that fueled me like, oh, what's really going on here? To go through something like this, it does take quite a while to, to kind of put it all together. How do you frame it, first of all? Are you are you a big outliner? Yeah, right. This book has so many tangents, and, and as, as the tangled story of the su- subtitle says, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. uh, there's so many characters. There's so many threads of the investigation. I do what I call mental mapping. So I get these very large sheets almost like um, drawing paper, and, I, and I, I put a subject in the middle of it, and I just start organizing thoughts around it, and it sort of becomes this layered sort of spider web of materials and, and uh, both evidence that I have or questions that I have, and, and I start building it up like that, and then from those mental maps, I start building a, a narrative structure out of it. But I'm also organic. As I'm writing these chapters, I'm also learning about the arc of the story as I'm going along. So I don't tie myself too tightly to an outline, but I kind of let the story go as I, as I write. Yeah, for me, uh, outlining and, and writing it down kind of keeps it organized mm. so you don't get it you know, kind of crossed or mixed. Right. Uh, especially when you do have a lot of characters and a lot of things going on. And I always find you, you find a lot of characters that all have a history or, or they're doing things that are – you, you've got to keep track of, and they do have a an influence on the case quite often. Right. Yes. Who do, whose point of view do you tell this from? This story. Ah, that's a really good question. Um, I, I gave a lot of thought to that. I, you know, the, the narrator here is very, very much me trying to make sense of this case. One of the things that I confronted with this, and I'm, I'm sure um, Michael also confronts this, is the lack of material right? And how you have to piece together certain elements. So I try to write this from a very particular kind of writer-narrator voice from there kind of, you know, it's the one who's trying to make sense of, of all the material that I have, as well as all the material that um, I don't have. That, that was my approach. Uh, I didn't want to get into any one particular perspective because that didn't seem right. I wanted to come in at, I want to come at it from a, a little more distance. 
more contemporary perspective looking back. Well, the newspaper articles about it, did uh, you see that there was quite a bit of bias depending on the newspaper? And then, then that would, had an effect on where you're going to go with it, actually. That actually is, the, that was a big hurdle, right? At this particular moment, uh, the, the competition among newspapers in New York City around this case and then nationally as well was really intense. And getting the facts of the case from those articles was difficult because they were often contradictory and they were often with some generosity. It, they were they were making up stories. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. Right. <laughs> they were lying. <laughs> right. Or just, just a spin. Yes. Uh, the New York American, for example, which was a Hearst publication, had ads they were putting in early on in this investigation for the, about this crime. They were putting out these $1,000 rewards, right, for any information leading to some resolution to the, to the mystery. So, of course, that generated... Um, a lot of folks writing in a lot of leads that were complete fantasies. And then the newspaper would be, you know, following them and publishing them. So that, of course, you have to navigate in trying to get to some truth or facts about the case itself. It is, sometimes it's real frustrating because you'll be uh, going through a paper and it'll tell you a ser set of facts, you know, like the, the per even the person's name, age, and what was happening. And then you go to another paper and it's different you know they're a different age they've got a different middle name yeah. they're a different sort of set of circumstances and it's like okay so who's telling me the truth right, right. yeah now it's completely frustrating to uh, to encounter that because you're you're trying to weed through it and maybe naively so i think about oh the press Back in that day, they had a much stronger sense of accuracy. But um, <laughs> how about the news agencies uh, at that at time? Because uh, the news agencies were a little more to the facts as opposed to spin. Um, was that the case in the 1920s, or were they as just messed up? Just messed up. <laughs> <laughs> in my, in my, I'll yeah. tell you, in my perspective, because yeah. I'm going through this right now. And it's, you know, when someone says to me, oh, you know, I remember the news and I wished it was back to Walter Cronkite and that, you know, the, where they had no bias. Oh, please, <laughs> please. Even the news, they were all like you were saying, Hearst. Hearst had so many. There was so much influence of what they reported and how they did it. I, I'm I'm losing faith every time I do a book. So that's my that's how, that's that's what I say. I don't know what you say, James. But. <laughs> Um, certainly with this book, uh, the more I got into the behaviors of the press, right? So one thing that came out of this, that uh, the competition among these newspapers, uh, they would send reporters out and the reporters would pretend to be detectives and they would get folks to talk. And the, the folks thought they were talking to detectives. And then they realized the next day that, they're, that what they told that person was on the front page. The schemes and the approaches of the press um, certainly were troubling. Certainly the bias. So one of the main characters in this book is Joseph Patterson. And Joseph Patterson was the founder of the New York Daily News. It was the first, right, kind of traditional kind of tabloid in the U.S., right? And he started in 1919. But he comes from a very wealthy media family. His grandfather was one of the founders of the New York, of the, sorry, Chicago Tribune. He wanted to, to start this tabloid and um, have a, 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 a newspaper for the working class man. As much as he came from a very wealthy family, he really tried to eschew all that wealth. Um, he considered himself a socialist and he wanted to have a publication that really um, spoke to working class people. But he also ran the Tribune News Service. The more I got into this, the more I saw that he was using the, the Tribune News Service to promote the positions of the New York Daily News as well. And so you had these news articles going out across the country that were really in line with editorial positions of the New York Daily News. The more you did get into the press and the news services, the more you see how the editors are really shaping those stories and, and, and through a political position and their own take. So the, the that yellow journalism that predates that with Pulitzer versus Hearst, you know, the world versus the, you know, the New York Journal. And then you were talking about a Hearst Journal as well. Like the nice thing about the, the Jack Ripper 
uh, time that predates that. So there was less of the journalism. But but the question I have then is, um, were you looking for a lot of corroboration or did you find other kind of sources that could corroborate? So my task was always to do that corroborate, to try to look at the facts across different publications, right? You know, that's the best approach, I think, because even from the local news, right, this, this, this murder happened in Westchester County, New York, and, and even on the local level, there are newspapers that are aligned with one political party versus another. And so as this case became more politicized, the newspapers were presenting articles that promoted their own kind of political position. So that is the task of just trying to gather up. And I had thousands of newspaper articles because this case was such a national news um, story. So you can start weeding through all those articles and try to make sense of what actually is the facts as we know it. I'm glad we don't have that problem with the media anymore. <laughs> I'm glad we've so moved on and solved this, you know, and now, now we have a, everything's good now. Everything's crystal. Uh, let's talk about the basic premise of the story so that uh, listeners will know kind of what the storyline is. This is a murder that happened in May of 1922. A uh, body of a young man was found along a road in Westchester County, fairly isolated road. Um, near the Kensico Reservoir. There was no ID. There was nothing on him to identify who he was. He was, um, when his body was found, it was arranged very neatly um, as one of the witnesses who came, up, came upon the body said it was arranged like an undertaker would have arranged it. So it was a very strange murder. There was one uh, bullet hole through his chest. After a couple of days, the coroner in there um, work saw that the, the young man had um, Navy issued underwear. So they sent his fingerprints to the uh, Naval Intelligence down in Washington, D.C. And by luck and chance, they made a match and they identified the body as Clarence Peters, 19 year old from Haverhill, Massachusetts, um, which was a small industrial shoe factory town along the New Hampshire, Massachusetts border. After his name was um, publicized in the press, another man, a 31-year-old Walter Ward, came forward to confess to shooting Clarence Peters. Uh, now, Ward, he was described in the press as the scion of the House of Ward. Uh, his father, George Ward, was the president of Ward Bakery. And Ward Bakery was a massive, very wealthy industrial bakery that was started in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, in Pittsburgh, and then it was moved to New York. And they had factories from Chicago to Boston down to Baltimore. And this was one of the pioneering companies uh, to industrialize bread making, right? And their main product at the time was called Tip Top Bread. Uh, eventually, the Ward Bakery Company would um, buy something that we probably all are familiar with, uh, in the 19, uh, late 1920s, they would buy Wonder Bread, a small company in the Midwest, and they would nationalize Wonder Bread across the country. But at the time, they were well-known family and business in bread baking and the bread, what was increasingly called the bread industry. Um, and so Ward's son, Walter Ward, confessed that he had killed Clarence Peters because Peters was part of a blackmail ring that had been blackmailing Walter Ward for months uh, and demanding uh, close to $100,000 from him. The question, of course, is what was the blackmail about? That became the central question for the investigation. What was the blackmail about? Ward and the family held tight to that secret. I'm waiting for the answer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just for to give it away. No. Oh, I was so all excited. I was just on the edge of my seat. And, and, and nothing. It went all quiet. So he was a sh shadow man? Is that how you said that he was? Right. So um, shadow man was a term that was used in different ways, both um, for folks who were blackmailing others. Blackmailing, um, and, and, and Michael, you must maybe have come across this from... From the early 20th century till about the 1930s, like blackmail be, it was was very much in the press all the time because it it was it was this you know threat to one's reputation, right? Um, 
And as cultural social mores started to change, um, blackmail became a really lucrative business because uh, you could you could easily um, ensnare folks into sexual or uh, sexual blackmail of some sort or um, other kinds of, of blackmail at time. Shadow man are, is, is a term that was used for these kinds of figures that would blackmail mostly wealthy folks, but even middle class folks um, to get a, um, a large sum of money or a small sum of money out of them. And so that's what, yeah, that's what the title comes from, these kinds of shady figures. But it also refers to um, just a sort of whole network of folks. Once this investigation started to go, all kinds of figures from the underworld started to come up and have information about what's behind this blackmail, what's behind this murder. You call it scandalous jazz America, age America. So let's, let's talk about that. What do you mean by that? There are many, you know, Jazz Age America, you pick your scandal, right? Uh, there are so many. I know, um, Alan, you've written about uh, a few of them, right? There, this one really had an impact because it was drawn out for 16 months. So the crime happened in uh, June of 1922 and then ran all the way to September of 1923 when there was ultimately a trial. Through that period, uh, it really, um, I think, kind of encapsulated a lot of the dynamics of that era around prohibition, around uh, women, more expansive freedoms, as a class dynamic. Again, the Ward family uh, was well known and Ward himself was well known for his gambling, for his his nightclub experiences. He loved to entertain women. He was married uh, with two kids, lived in New Rochelle, New York. His wife was much younger as well. And they kind of epitomized that era in some respect. And certainly Walter Ward, as I, as I say in the book, he really, they could have walked out of a, a great Gatsby party the way that they both looked as well as the way they kind of the stories around them it, it, it's a it's a fascinating time how, how do you find the society around jazz jazz was considered very um i think from the conservative point of view it was probably considered quite um a bad direction for the country right they probably didn't like the way you know a woman would start smoking and they're chain cutting their hair and there's all these different things going on do you think that affects what goes on when, with even the policing and the crimes and when murders happen? Right. You know, um, one thread of this investigation took detectives into what was called the Tenderloin, which was the west side of Manhattan, west of Times Square, where a lot of these speakeasies and private clubs had developed during Prohibition, right? And many of them catered to very wealthy, proper folks who just wanted to have a good time. And one, you know, one of the famous ones was uh, started by Larry Fay. He was a kind of a gangster figure, but he started this nightclub. And the hostess of this nightclub uh, was famous for her line, "Hello, suckers," right? Which which has lived on from from her time. She said that partly because of these kind of cover charges that they would charge. That was the instituting cover charges to get into these clubs because, you know, they were private, so they protect a little bit from police. But also uh, the kind of clientele who were made vulnerable because these clubs were also great places to blackmail the wealthy uptown, east side, uh, suburban folks who came in uh, to have a good night on the town. In one way, yeah, jazz was seen as morally suspect. Um, certainly in, in the research I did with this book, it was also very much part of a, of a, of a nightlife that wealthy folks, um, respectable folks really enjoyed. Like I said, I'm glad that kind of bias is gone now. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. Exactly. <laughs> well, that's, that's another element, right? That's, uh, there's so many parts of this book where I feel like it's just a mirror. It's a hundred year old mirror. Seems like we have the same fights over and over again and nothing really changes, you know? Sometimes, I guess I shouldn't say that because things do change, but it just takes a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, so why, why were so many famous people involved in this case? What attracted them about this particular case, like to get people like you were saying, Houdini and Conan Doyle mm -hmm. and 
Fitzgerald and stuff like why why were so many people jumping on and making comments about it well the the Arthur Conan Doyle yes I love that chapter in this book he was on a tour of the U.S. through the spring of 1922 yeah I, I learned a lot about him in his later years here right so in his later years this writer creator of Sherlock Holmes got so invested and so committed to what he called spiritualism that we, through mediums and seances, we could connect to the dead. And he saw this as like the new religion. I find it funny, particularly today, I find it funny. He thought that America was right to really embrace this new religion, much more so than he did. <laughs> <laughs> and so he made efforts, you know, to really promote it. And so in, in the spring of 22, he hired a marketing company. He traveled in style to the U.S. and he did lectures uh, around the Northeast into the Midwest. At one point when he was in New York, this case was probably about three weeks old, four weeks old. And of course, reporters wanted to find out from Conan Doyle what would Sherlock Holmes do to solve this case? He didn't know, much, he said he didn't know much about the case, but he said, I think Sherlock Holmes would try to uh, investigate the family because I think that whatever the blackmail is, it's going to be there in the family. And then he said, but what would really be helpful is if the police employed a, a medium to speak to Clarence Peters. And if we could be able to speak to Clarence Peters, we would be able to find out what really happened how he was really murdered. I have no record that the police did that, but that was Conan Doyle's approach. Now, the other part of this that I write about in here is that uh, Doyle's lectures were, as you can imagine, um, both celebrated and criticized, mostly criticized by pastors and religious folk around the country that thought um, Conan Doyle was preaching a kind of evil religion uh, this, this ability to speak to the dead. So they were very critical of his, of his talks and his lectures. In fact, I think it was a pastor out in, uh, the Midwest somewhere that said to the effect, Doyle has spent so much time creating criminals. He has forgotten the line between good and evil. But the biggest group to really be suspicious of Doyle's new religion were magicians because, of course, they understood that mediums, the, the tools of mediums to create seances and to create the effects of their trade. And so um, Houdini um, happened to invite Conan Doyle to address the annual meeting of the American Society of Magicians that was being held in New York City in, in June of 1922. And, and this came after one of the board members on the uh, society had written these editorials across the country about what a fake this new religion is. And, you know, he, he had a, uh, a reward of $5,000 for anyone who could present him an actual medium and not someone who's using some tricks of the trade. And so uh, uh, Conan Doyle uh, gave a talk at the magician, but mostly he just showed a, a film. And I write about this. It was a film that showed prehistoric animals roaming around on Earth, right? And it was kind of a baffling film, right? It was a silent film. We have to remember that film was still fairly new. And so when, when these magicians were looking at it, they, they, they took it as fact, like that this was being filmed. And where are these, where is this place on the planet where there's still prehistoric animals? <laughs> you know, it was, it was an attempt by Conan Doyle to call out the magicians who were calling out him, right? And so he left that, he didn't take any questions about the film. He just left um, that dinner and then uh, wrote to Houdini the next day and said, oh, I was just having a little fun with you all. And it turns out that film was created in, in early Hollywood, and it was for film that um, based on a book that um, Conan Doyle had written. I use this moment, right, playing with what is true and what is false and what is what we can know and what we can't know, um, because that seemed very important to the context of this investigation, which was constantly being confronted with what is true and what is not about this case and about the blackmail that the Ward family claimed. Sounds like that was at the beginning of the investigation, that it was a May murder, and that was June. Yeah, this happened um, early in the uh, in the investigation, but it but it gave me a sense of how 
the cultural context, right? Because Conan Doyle's lecture was really well publicized across the country. And, and he was writing articles. Again, he was on a mission to really promote this and get people um, believing in this new religion. I feel like there was this kind of cultural context there about understanding what was true and what was, you know, what we can know and what we can believe and what um, might not be believable. I always find that to be the hardest part um, because, you know, you um, can take the different stories and kind of try to relate to them, but we're relating to them with our sense of today, not a not hundred years ago and what it was like to live in that that time and and how we lived and stuff so i always find that to be the hardest part it's very challenging i want to capture what this case would have felt like at the time like how people would have understood it or what what are the values and ideas that would have been circulating at the time so people are reading the newspaper they're reading the article about conan doyle's new religion and they're reading the, the latest article about this crime, or they're reading about a, a, a labor protest, uh, which w- were happening a lot in the early 1920s, right? So I'm trying to figure out this cultural context and, and situate the crime in that. And it's really hard to do, but I'm, you know, trying to see it through that period's eyes. Yeah, it's, it's always the hardest thing. You have to really kind of put yourself into that place and then uh, we forget, you know, it's the little things too. It's like when they get up in the morning, how did they make breakfast? What was the, what was the scenario of, of making coffee or cooking or did they have that? Um, what did they do? Did they have power in their home? Anything like what you have to think of all the little things to put yourself in the place of what a human is going through each day. Newspapers were very important to yeah. the people. They, they read them, you know, page to page. And I love how unorganized newspapers are. <laughs> You notice how they just start writing something and then they start writing another article, another article, and you find part two on page eight or something, you know. Yeah. It's just, they're just kind of all over the place. There's no, it's not very well organized. It's just there. And it just, it, it kind of, uh, that's another one. I scratch or that one, I'll tell you, it makes me mad. <laughs> and they don't always tell you where the article is jumping to. <laughs> exactly. You have to, so you go to the next page and you type in the, the code words and hope to find it. You know, thank God for the computers now because in the old days when you went into the mm. library itself and you had to go through that, you couldn't do that. Well, that leads to a good question. The question is like, did you go into subsequent decades to find out any information that was discovered 10 years later or 15 years later to kind of put a better perspective or a, kind of verify or corroborate anything? That is a great question. I did through, as, as we say, the, the, the newspaper databases are, makes that a little easier to do, to, to, to type in some key terms or names of folks um, in the decades. So through the 30s, 40s, and 50s, I did try to track to see if anything had come about in that. And there was nothing that came up in that search. Of course, I, I also wanted to track to see some of the main figures in this crime, what happened to them, you know, over the years, right? So what happened to Ward's wife and the kids and so forth. So I did get useful information in sort of telling a story after the fact. It does seem that um, after 1923 and that trial, that that was it. That was, uh, that was the end of the case. You know, there were a couple... Um, uh, maybe in the late 20s, there were a couple of these retrospective pieces in the New York press that would point to the Ward Peters case in the context of blackmail, right? These blackmail cases, right? Nothing um, substantial and certainly nothing to, to reopen. Well, and that, that leads me always to this, especially because I don't know how you are when you're dealing with true events and stuff and you're going through all that and you put you dedicate a lot of time and you kind of live in this period for the whole time you wrote the book and stuff when you're going through all this and you learn about how people are and how you know from a different time and perspective and stuff do you you think this book changes you as a writer as a person that's a really good question um i think about halfway into writing this book i did have this moment of like i can't finish this book (laughs) because there are no redeeming characters in this book. <laughs> and, and that's a little exaggeration. There are a couple that might be <laughs> redeeming. But, right, there's there, like everybody in this book could be a kind form of shadow man, right? 
from the wealthy family who was clearly engaged in in all kinds of business practices that would 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 be you know illegal today. Everybody in this book seems to be working towards their own self interest and using this case to work to their own self interest. And so yeah, there was a moment where I thought I. I, I keep giving voice to these characters that these real life characters, right? Who just, are, there's no, no, nothing redeemable about them. And, and it did make me sort of look at them and think, wow, this, how, how did they do this? How did they, I know I had to get in their mindset. Right. And I, I don't know if that's what you're talking about, Alan, like you have to get in the mindset of these folks to understand motivations and why they wrote this letter or why they did this. And, and that does get, draining. It takes a while to get out of that book, out of that world that I create. It's, it's exhausting uh, mentally. It's, it's, um, but, you know, you just got to let it go and go with it. That's how I can finish it, because then you realize that, you know, you know, I've worked with Michael, so I know how bad people are. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day, what do you hope people get out of it when someone picks up the book? I mean, I, I, I'm, they're going to learn a lot, of course, but what is it you hope a reader takes away from the book? As much as this book is trying to tell this story of this crime and this investigation and all the particulars of that. Um, and I'm hoping, you know, I worked really hard to, keep, to make it a very compelling story to read, right? I do hope that that other element of the story, the, the cultural context, but also this, this story of, of the criminal justice system. And, you know, that's very much in the news right now and has been. Uh, but to, to see how this played out, right? So there's, there, there are a number of judges in this and lawyers uh, and the ways in which this, they, they made use of the system, um, the ways in which the, the Ward family really harnessed their own wealth and privilege um, to protect themselves within that system. So I do think um, there's, there's much to take away in this story about a history of privilege within that justice system. There is a trial uh, and there is a verdict. But I think it leaves a lot of questions even after that verdict. As I as I have a epigram to the to the book, um, and I quote um, Gertrude Stein, who from this article she wrote when she went on a uh, she went around uh, on a police patrol in Chicago in the 1930s. There's a bigger context there I won't go into, but she she was there and she, and, and she wrote this piece that got syndicated. And, one line from it, she says, there remains a mystery that always remains there even after you know who did it. Um, and I do think that that's really the heart of this book and raises questions about even if we think of justice being produced or um, the court system worked, there's still these doubts and questions that come about. Do you like readers to interact with you? Do you like to have conversations? Do you have like a social media set up for readers? Do you have website how do you interact with readers absolutely um on instagram uh, james.holchin they can find me there or um on twitter as well james bolchin i i'm always happy to hear from readers um i am soon to have a book club page on my website so i'm happy to also uh talk with book clubs about this book and about their own ideas about what happened to Clarence Peters. Well, great. We'll have all that up on the website as well, and so people can find you with one click easily. Excellent. So we, well, we appreciate you here, and also the book, Shadow Man, and it's by James Polson. So thank you for being here. Great. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, nice speaking with you. This has been a production of the House of Mystery Radio Show. To find out more about our show, guests, or hosts, go to our website at houseofmysteryradio.com.